Hey everyone, Scott Cunningham, make a Sconcy business. Today we're going to be going through the second post in my Logical Fallacies series. I'm switching them all to a video format, or at least I am doing a video version of all of them for you guys on YouTube and other video hosting applications so that you don't have to just read it or if you prefer to consume it this way, you can. So I'm trying to do these quickly because I've already done this and um, I'm really just redoing, re-giving you guys the information. So let's just jump right into it. Alphabet soup fallacy. This is a classic one that you actually see a lot. Um, you'll see it with people who have more, you know, high class positions, but you can really see it with anything. It's just when someone uses a lot of abbreviations, acronyms, just inside information that wouldn't make sense to anyone outside of that. So whether, you know, it's a lawyer referring to all these different like bills and sections of bills, whether it's me talking about crypto and I keep referring to, uh, you know, the three letter coin abbreviations or just confusing things that, that wouldn't register for most people. It is a way to confuse or impress people. And it is definitely a fallacy uh, that you can point out if you see someone doing it a lot because they know the other people don't know and uh, they're purposely doing it to, again, typically impress or confuse. There might be another reason, but that's generally why they would do that. So make sure you can identify that and avoid that for yourself as well, especially when you're talking to someone who really isn't on the inside group of uh, whatever you're talking about. Even if it's something simple, right? It doesn't have to be something very technical. It could just be something that you know they don't know. So any kind of, you know, specific names or references or certain things will just confuse them. Uh, alternative truth fallacy. So this one is pretty recent. It's it, it's essentially just presenting alternative facts and denying the truth. It's similar to conspiracy theory, you know, like generally, but it's more so for denying conspiracy theories. That might be true. Uh, it, it's usually used as like a false fallacy to condemn conspiracy theories. And, uh, you know, you have to strictly use this under the right circumstances. And, um, you know, the easiest thing to say, it's like, you know, gravity isn't real. Thus, you know, your argument that you're making is wrong. And um, they're just presenting alternative facts. It's like, that's not even true. I mean, gravity isn't real is pretty obvious, but um, people might take, you know, part of the truth and then twist it. And then it might still make sense when they talk about it. If you don't know different things, I mean, uh, there's, you know, the, the light side of it and the really like intense side of, of, of using this fallacy. But you know, just keep a keep a look out for this one. You won't see this very much in actual debates, um, just because it's really obvious most of the time, and it really discredits people if they're doing something like this because it's pretty hard to do this accidentally. So something to note. Uh, the rest are different appeals to fallacies. So there's a lot of different ones, but in this one we're just going to cover closure, heaven, nature, and tradition. So. Essentially, the appeal to fallacies are just when someone is appealing to a specific, you know, a specific notion, whether it's like emotion or, you know, some of the things that we're going to cover here. They're appealing to a very specific niche thing that could sway a certain group or a certain type of person. And uh, it, it, it depends on who. But there's a lot of different ways that this is done. So let's dive into this. We'll we'll look at closure first. So the appeal to closure. So for an example, a, a, just an easy way to explain this is with an example. So someone says, you know, you owe me five bucks. And even though I said I wouldn't charge you interest, you owe me interest or our debt won't be truly settled. So that's an appeal to closure because they're saying even though technically it, it, it is done, they're appealing to the idea that you need to have closure on this. Because realistically, you don't actually have to give them interest if they didn't ask for interest, but they're appealing to the idea that you need to have closure on this, that it's actually not done. And it, it, it might not be for money. It could really be anything. It's just 
an idea, no matter how questionable, that demands it has to be accepted or it would otherwise remain unsettled, right? So another one could be, you were sentenced to prison, but because the family demanded they would be unsettled unless the criminal dies, uh, they managed to get a death sentence to provide closure. That, you know, makes sense on the on the side of the people, but legally that doesn't really make sense, right? We've decided, you know, you get this, this is how it is. Oh, wait, we're appealing to the idea that closure must be had. So we're going to change the sentence. That is pretty relevant. I mean, that could be a touchy example for some people, um, but it definitely makes sense logically as to why that's an issue. So an appeal to heaven or arg uh, argumentum ad colum. I assume that's how you pronounce that. I hate doing the Latin versions. This is seen generally in debates and it's used. It's not usually used maliciously. It's more so. I mean, it's, it's usually because they're so fervently believing in their faith. Some people might, you know, use this on purpose to, uh, you know, use it as a fallacy, but I feel that most people, when they, you know, appeal to heaven, that they're, they're just religious and it's just a part of their faith. It's not like they're doing it on purpose, but this is illogical and I'll tell you why. So when someone claims to know the mind of God or some higher power, basically they're saying like, I know better than all of you and I don't have to prove it because I can't slash only I can know this. So you can't get to know whether I know it or not. You just have to believe me. And, um, and you know, they'll use this to then say, and God or, you know, the higher power has approved of something that I've done or told me to do something and no one can challenge it because it's the higher power and you can't hear it. So you can't, uh, you can't be a part of this because you don't have that connection, but I do. And there's no way for you to disprove that. And, you know, like you, you there, we've seen crazy people go and do something like God ordered me to kill a bunch of people. And, you know, that is an extreme, but you've seen, you, you'll see all types of versions of this. I mean, it's a lot less prevalent today than it was, you know, obviously like with the crusades and different things like that, but it is still something to be mindful of. If someone is going to justify that a divine power has approved of whatever they're doing, or, you know, that's the only reason why they're able to do what they do, or they're allowed to, or they're told to, that is really, really not an argument. You know, that could never hold up logically that some power, some magical invisible thing told you to do something and no one else can hear it or see it or verify it, but we have to trust you. No. Um, and, and, and again, the reason why is because it has to be objective and it has to be like provable and usable and applicable for everyone. Because if everyone then said that, I've been approved of uh, whatever I'm doing by a higher power, then everyone's in the same conflict of trying to prove that they're actually the one getting the higher powers, you know, communication and acting on that. And, and no one could prove it. Thus, it's illogical. An appeal to nature. This one's kind of interesting because it kind of goes both ways. So this is the fallacy that because something is natural, it must be good, pure, or have some positive trait. They could also say that because it isn't natural, it must be evil. And we're actually seeing this a lot more today uh, where people are saying, oh, well, it's not natural, so it's bad. Or, you know, uh, it didn't come from the earth, so it's bad. Or like humans are infecting the earth with machinery. So anything that isn't, uh, you know, natural is bad. But technically that doesn't make sense because the machines are built out of everything that was natural once and almost everything is is built that way and that's kind of just how the world works so for example um someone could say you know marijuana is fine uh because it's natural and while it's generally not that bad 
Um, obviously, children shouldn't be having it just because it's natural. That doesn't somehow void the danger, right? Someone might say, um, you know, uh, because this herb is freshly picked and it's dried naturally, it uh, it's it's pure and beautiful, but it's actually poison ivy. So, you know, like, because you, you can make this on both sides. You could, wow, that is so beautiful. That's natural. It must be great. You go and you eat it. It's poison ivy. You're, you're suffering. Okay. And, um, you know, like, or, or, you know, there's no additives. It's natural ingredients only. That sounds great, but it could still be a terrible, awful thing. Right. Or, or, or assuming that because there was something added, and because it's not totally organic and totally natural, that uh, it's bad, and you shouldn't use it or consume it or whatever it might be. There's also appeal to emotion. This one's much more widely known, where you're basically just trying to manipulate people based on, um, you know, some sort of emotional, compelling argument like. After 9-11, a lot of politicians would be always referencing to it. You know, they're appealing to the people's emotion. They're not logically arguing something. They're just trying to, to win your hearts over. Because that is how charisma works. You're trying to get the person to decide with their heart uh, rather than their head. Because a lot of people do. But logically, in a debate, you should only be arguing with your heart your head you with your mind with logic not trying to play on people's emotions because it's very manipulative especially if there's disasters and different things and you're able to um to manipulate someone because of that um like for example like this is a great one bill is accused of murder but he's a firefighter and he helps save lives he also has a puppy who he loves and he's a patriot so how could he possibly commit a crime against the you know what he's worked to protect this doesn't actually, you know, prove that he wasn't at the scene of the crime, that he didn't have fingerprints on the on the murder weapon, whatever it might be. This is just, you know, appealing to emotion when realistically it's like he could be all those things and a murderer still. Appeal to pity. This is sort of similar, but it's more about like you know, urging the audience to root for the underdog under the assumption that the underdog is more deserving of your support because, you know, obviously they're not if they're the underdog. I mean, maybe they are, but generally if someone is the underdog, it's because they're doing bad because they don't deserve your support. But then this is to make it seem like, well, they actually, you know, they're fighting against, you know, the, the odds and they're the underdog and that's why they deserve your support. You should be helping the little guy out. And a lot of people are like, oh, like, yeah, like that's me. I'm trying to, you know, get out of this run and, and you know, get out of being the underdog so I can relate. And then I want to vote for the underdog and help them as well. And everyone likes an underdog story. It's much more interesting, like Rocky. Um Appeal to, to drish, blah, appeal to tradition this is the final one. This is a very classic one. This is usually for like religion or like conservatives, a very, very conservative argument. It is just essentially saying that something is correct or right because it's the way that it's always been done. And, you know, it's a very classic argument. It's like, well, that's the way we've always done it. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, something doesn't need to be broke for it to be able to be improved, right? Uh, cars not having seatbelts wasn't broke and, you know, accidents happened, it could be improved and it was. There's, I mean, a million different things that can be improved and that you could argue against because of tradition and different things. But we've seen uh, that, you know, like women not being able to vote or have equal pay or same sex marriage, all these different things, obviously always being traditional and using that as an argument is not uh, really valid uh, logically. So that's everything. Let me know what you guys think. I hope this was educational and enlightening. Let me know in the comments below. I'm Scott Cunningham, AK Sconcy Business, signing off. Cheers.